curriculum architecture design. Do you have a curriculum architecture design? Or do you have a curriculum artisan design? How engineered is your curriculum architecture? Many approaches to curriculum architecture or what's known as learning architecture aren't even really artistic, let alone engineered. They are often a curriculum of modules rather than a modular curriculum. There is a big difference. Architecture is often concerned with large-scale and small-scale aspects of an engineered product, whether that be an entire city or campus, buildings, houses, rooms, and all the construction materials right down to the nails and fasteners, the smallest details. Gary Rumler reviewed my methodologies back in 1999 as part of my book Lean ISD and he wrote, if you want to ground your fantasy of a corporate university with the reality of a sound engineering approach to instructional systems that will provide results, you should learn about the PAC processes. If you are a leader of or a serious participant in the design and implementation of a large-scale corporate curriculum, then this book is for you. This system could be the difference between achieving bottom-line results with your training or being just another little red schoolhouse. Lean ISD, which is the name of my book, covers the PAC processes. PAC is an acronym for performance-based, accelerated, customer and stakeholder driven, training and development of any blend. It covers training, instruction, learning, and knowledge management. There are five key methodology sets to the PAC processes. PAC analysis, which feeds all three levels of design of the PAC processes. Curriculum architecture design, modular curriculum development, which is the addy like methodology of the PAC processes, and a subcomponent to MCD, IAD, instructional activity development. And then there's the PAC project planning and management methodologies and tools, which cover all of the aspects of PAC. PACT again has three levels of instructional systems design, CAD, MCD, and IAD. Curriculum architecture design is looking at an entire target audience's required learning continuum from the very beginning of onboarding through the very end of their career development. But the curriculum architecture design is intended to take a person down the learning path to performance competence. Modular curriculum development, as I said earlier, is the addy like level, the new product development level of the PAC processes. This is where courses or workshop or what the PAC processes calls events, modular events, is produced. Instructional activity development is a methodology set that addresses the subcomponents of modular curriculum development. Perhaps your client only needs the performance tests or knowledge tests and not all the rest of the instruction and information that could be produced in a typical modular curriculum development project. Perhaps all they need is job aids and not a traditional course. IAD is the methodology set that narrows MCD down to producing components of traditional instruction and information that are performance-based, performance-oriented, and intended to impact people's performance competence in meeting the requirements of their job. CAD, MCD, and IAD are multiple levels of an architectural design approach to instruction. There are four levels of specific PAC design of instruction and information. There's the path level, the event level, the module and lesson level, and the instructional activity level, the final level of design of the PAC.
impact processes. In curriculum architecture design, which is a four-phase process, there are three levels of design out of the four. A curriculum architecture design project produces a training and development or learning path. It identifies for all gaps an event specification, a modular event specification. And then there are the module specifications or specs for the gaps within the event. If you thought of the event as a book, the modules would be the chapter of the book. The path would then be the reading assignments for some learning purposes, for some performance purposes. An example of a training and development path which presents the modular events is provided here. Notice that some of the events have a blank circle and not a full red circle or a partial red circle. This is a total gap. The content for this doesn't exist. The event specifications and module specifications would give the clients a clue as to what would be included in this should it be worthy of their investments. The training and development event specification sheet articulates that gap event and it identifies the various modules. In this case, there are two of them. The training and development module specification sheet identifies the content that would be covered should this module be brought to market, whether that's brought together in the event fully or perhaps that event is brought to market with only one of the modules built and deployed and the other one not being deemed to be priority and the other not being deemed to be of high enough priority and worthy of the business investment for the potential returns. What feeds this portion of the mod spec is all of the analysis data the performance model data and the enabling knowledge and skills matrices data. More on this later. A curriculum architecture design project does not produce any new content. It simply identifies the need, rationalizes existing available content as to its ability to be used as is or after modification or is not appropriate to this particular need. The fourth phase of a curriculum architecture design project, implementation planning, prioritizes and prices out the cost for going forward in implementing the gaps of the curriculum architecture design. That then leads to many MCD and IAD efforts, which again are the new product development or ADI like levels of the PAC processes. MCD and IAD design follows a six-phase approach. MCD and IAD projects may be undertaken without a prior curriculum architecture design. There are three levels of design in MCD and IAD. There's the event level, which may or may not come from a prior CAD effort, but it's the design of the event. In MCD, if there was a prior CAD level, modules become lessons. They are the equivalent. However, we enable the designers and the design team to reconfigure an event now that they're looking at it more closely, more seriously. It's a real project. The third level of instructional design in MCD and IED is what we call instructional activities. An IED project might often just focus on instructional activities, building the subcomponents of a lesson. But sometimes they also include the lesson level. IAD again is for non-traditional instruction, which is typically packaged as some sort of an event, whether that's a face-to-face -face event or an asynchronous event or a book that's turned into a PDF or a video.
or is some structured on-the-job training. Back to MCD and IAD design. An example of an event map of lessons is presented here. Some of these lessons may already exist in content currently available and the rest of them might be gaps. When there are gaps, there are lesson maps produced. These take the analysis data and structure it into both information, demonstration, and application. However, there's not always applications and not always demonstrations as part of a lesson. Most of the time, a lesson minimally has information that's presented. However, there are lessons where it could be singularly focused on a demonstration or an application. The PAC Processes provides this kind of flexibility for the design team to specify what needs to be developed and or acquired and then pilot tested. For example, this information instructional activity on the lesson map is articulated in this instructional activity specification. This is where all of the analysis data, the performance data, the enabling knowledge and skill data, and perhaps some existing content that was assessed to be used after modification will find its home in the design deliverables of MCD and IAD. All of the performance model data, all of the knowledge and skill data collected, finds its way to this level of design in the PAC processes. This is where the nails and the wallboard and the cove molding, all of the components of the eventual architectural design reside. The performance model data and the knowledge and skill data is designed in a facilitated process. Initially, it's sorted into the various lessons of the event. Then it is sorted again into the information, demonstration, and application elements of a lesson. And then it finally finds its way into an instructional activity. The design process is a process of sorting this type of data into the eventual lowest level of the design, the instructional activity spec, or what we call the activity spec. This is an example of the analysis data. For a job of account representative, there may be seven areas of performance. Areas of performance are also known as major duties, key results areas, etc. There are many names for this concept. The goal here is to configure the job into these chunks so that there are no overlaps or gaps with all the analysis details. Those details include what are the outputs and measures for an area of performance. There are often more than one output and there are often more than one measure for each output. This is beginning with the end in mind. When we're doing territory planning, the output is a territory plan. And there are tasks to be done to produce that plan. Oftentimes there are various roles with different responsibilities in the performance of tasks, depending on whether your tasks are at a macro level, a mid-level, or a micro level. These first three column sets, outputs, tasks, and roles and responsibilities, articulate ideal performance, especially when you're using a team of master performers to help you articulate this performance, the performance requirements of the job, the authentic performance requirements of the job. The last three columns, typical performance gaps, probable gap causes, and an articulation of whether those gap causes are deficiency of the environment, a deficiency of the knowledge and skills of the performer, or deficiency of the individual's attributes and values, constitutes a gap analysis against the ideal. The gap analysis on the right is directly related to the ideal performance on the left. 
if master performers are capable and able to perform ideally, as articulated on the left, the question becomes, what about those who are not currently master performers? What are their typical performance gaps? What are the probable gap causes for those? And can training do anything about that? And if training cannot because it's not at the root of the issue, where should management look in order to make a fix? Do they need to re-engineer the environment? Do they need to change the recruiting and selection processes and hire the people with the right individual attributes and values? Those attributes include physical attributes, intellectual attributes, and psychological attributes, and personal values. When we systematically derive the enabling knowledge and skills to perform per the performance model, we look at 17 categories so that we can systematically tease out or derive all of the enabling knowledge and skills, not just some list from some casual brainstorming effort. We systematically tease out what are the policies, procedures, practices, and guidelines that are required when you're performing. What are the laws, regulations, codes, agreements, and contracts? Are there industry standards? Are there internal organizations and resources to be used? Are there external organizations and resources? Does the performer need to know anything about the marketplace, the product and service knowledges of the company, various process knowledge, records, reports, documents, and forms, materials, and supplies, tools, equipment, and machinery, computer systems, and software, and hardware? Are there personal or interpersonal skills that are required to perform? If the job is about management and supervisory, what are their unique knowledge and skills? Are there business knowledge and skills, professional and technical or functional knowledge and skills required? This approach is very detailed, but it produces all of the components down to the nails and fasteners required to architect a learning path. An example knowledge and skill matrices that captures all of the details for the category of policies and procedures is presented here. Here the specific knowledge and skill items in this category are linked back to the performance. So one can ask, if we have EEO training, does it address more than just generic EEO? Does it teach how to do the tasks to produce the outputs associated with area performance A. You can see here that EEO is only part of the A portion of area performance. Affirmative action, likewise. But vacation and day off policies are a part of four areas of performance. And the discipline policy is related to two. On the right hand side of this chart, we can define whether or not that selection or training is responsible for ensuring that the performers have these knowledge and skills. The default is usually training, however, the selection process may require people to have certain of these knowledge and skills before they're given the job. We can also assess how critical is this knowledge and skill item to my ability to be a master performer. Is it high, medium, low, or perhaps a zero? And if it's zero, then one wonders why it made it to the list in the first place. We can also assess how difficult is it for the typical learner to master this, to learn this. We can also assess how volatile is the content because this will help us in our packaging decisions later in the design process. And we can also capture how deep must this content go? Can we simply provide a high level awareness of that item or do we need to go deeper into knowledge and provide that? Or should we actually go to building a skill? Do I need to be aware of welding, knowledgeable about welding, or skillful in welding? The same with active listening. Do I simply need to know what it is? Do I need to know a lot about it? Do I actually need to be able to do it? What level of depth should the eventual training go to? Should this become a worthy priority? All of the performance data 
and all of the knowledge and skill data constitutes a bill of materials, what's known as a BOM. That's the performance data and the enabling knowledge and skill data. All of that bill of materials, all of those items, all of the information about the outputs and the associated tasks and the various roles and responsibilities makes it way into an event map of lessons. The same with all the knowledge and skills. Again, they are sorted into then the lesson maps into the information and demonstration and application components, the instructional activities of a lesson. And finally, they reside here at this level of the design articulation, the instructional activity specification, or informally known as the activity spec. Training and development or learning path is a path of events. The event map is a map of lessons. The lesson map is a map of instructional activities. And the instructional activity specification captures all of the analysis data. So the question, again, is do you have a curriculum architecture design or is your learning path or training and development path or instructional path or learning continuum the result of an artistic process? Is it a curriculum artisan design or a curriculum architecture design? There is a big difference. My book, Lean ISD, which is available as a hardbound book, a paperback book, and a free 410-page PDF on my website, articulates the PAC processes. This book was published in 1999 after almost 20 years in development. In 2011, I reconfigured Lean ISD and some other books and columns from publications into a new series of books. Those most relevant to this discussion include the book Analysis of Performance Competence Requirements. This is intended for the instructional analyst, the PACT analyst. Then there's the PACT Processes for Performance-Based Curriculum Architecture Design, and the book The PACT Processes for Performance-Based Modular Curriculum Development, and a book for the managers, the Curriculum Manager's Handbook, talking about curriculum architecture design, modular curriculum development, and curriculum deployment. There are other books in my six pack. The other two focus on management areas of performance competence when the target audience is managers and leaders. And you want to take a performance orientation to the articulation of their curriculum. The final book in the series is From Training to Performance Improvement Consulting. How to move your organization from training to performance-based training and then to performance improvement consulting using the PACT analysis methods expanded to the EPI, Enterprise Process Performance Improvement Analysis Methods. I've been doing curriculum architecture design since 1982. I created this configuration of the PAC processes to help learners, performers, master these instructional design models, concepts, methods, tools, and techniques. 